we are talking about chapters 15, and I'm going to cover 16, as we discussed two weeks ago. Uh, chapter 15 is on S4, and then chapter 16 is going to cover the trade-offs. So comparing S4 to S3, and then S3 to uh, R6. All right, so we're going to introduce S4. Um, high level, go over it. We're going to talk about classes, generics, and methods um, in general and then specific to S4 because the implementation uh, is different. They have a lot of uh, functions for controlling the things that you would just do willy nilly in S3. Um, they have kind of a formal system for S S4, so we'll go over that. And we're going to talk about prototypes, constructors, helpers, and validators. These are um, effectively uh, tools to, uh, for us as programmers, he likes to say, uh, to help users uh, access, our, uh, access our S4 objects in the most consistent um, and easy way possible. And then we're going to talk about creating and accessing generics and methods. And then we'll go over method dispatch, multiple inheritance, and multiple dispatch, which is unique. The multiple inheritance and multiple dispatch seems to be unique to S4. So we'll go over that. And then interaction of S4 and S3. There's like this S3 is like the old system, and S4 is the new system, even though um, S3 is had a little more staying power than I suspect um, Chambers and other developers had anticipated. But initially, I think there was this idea of it's a upgrade or it's an evolution in, in object-oriented programming for R. And then we'll throw in trade-offs. So it's a whole chapter. I'm going to throw it in at the end and just to go over high level what the benefits are, um, why we choose S3 versus S4 versus R6. Okay, so S4. So why S4, right? Um, I mean, overall, object oriented programming is trying to solve. Well, one of the problems it solves is like this uh, overpopulation of functions, right? Like you could have, um, for a user, you could have to access a growing number of functions to process different classes and it would just be, it just gets very cumbersome at a certain point. So one solution that object-oriented program, programming provides is um, overloading functions, giving them multiple methods behind the scenes. They can pass the function, they can pass an object of, of any class to a function and it will take care of the complexity and look up the method and, and, and uh, give them the take the action that they're expecting. All right, so uh, it's very similar to S3 in that, in that regard, it's solving that, that problem. Um, now, so if S3 and S4 are solving the same problem, then why S4 in, in the first place? And it seems like what they did with S4 is they, they work to formalize like how, like you can create a class with S3, you can't really create a class, I don't think, right? So like, it's this, it goes to a hidden uh, hidden object, but it's there. There's not an instance of it anywhere, um, but you can actually define this class that, can, that you can then um, create objects of. So that's formal. Um, and then like the, the way you create the, the objects, you define the, the attributes a little more, um, precisely, and you have to be a little more thoughtful about um, uh, what's going to inherit what and where uh, the, the method's going to fall in, in the method call and all these considerations. So it's, it's definitely more formal and rigorous. Uh, so another cool thing about S4 is that it's written by John Chambers himself, um, which could be a good thing. I happen to I don't know John Chambers, but he seems like a respectable guy. And it's used extensively by the uh, Bioconductor Project. Um, and Hadley mentions that you may want to contribute to that someday. It's, it's large. It's 
prominent in the community. So that's uh, another reason to use S4 or to learn it a little bit. And it's independent from S3. So they are separate systems. So it's, uh, it's not redundant. You can learn it and you can go off and, and do things fresh and exciting all on its own. Oh, and then it also has this uh, idea of multiple inheritance. So you can um, build a base class and then build a class that inherits attributes from that class and you add additional attributes. So you got like your, so you just ba basically build up in terms of complexity from a, a basic class to more um, advanced classes. So it's a good way of managing complexity. Uh, and then it has a cool feature. So they, instead of having like uh, just attributes, it takes those, that, those attributes and it, um, you think of them as slots, you treat them as slots. So it's, uh, and you can subset and access those slots with uh, the at symbol. And all the implementations in the methods package. So it's a one-stop shop to uh, accessing the the builders and the helpers and all that stuff. Okay, so that is the introduction. Now we're gonna go over uh, classes, generics, and methods for S4 in specific, and then a little bit in general as well. So for S4, how do you actually create a class? Like this isn't something um, like you just define, like class is an attribute and you define it for S3. I mean, I'm not an expert on S3 by any means, but that's what I recall. So for uh, S4 though, you have a function. So there's a specific function, set class, you name it, you give the class a name, and then slots, are, uh, you, it's basically a list of uh, name value pairs and, and you are, those are gonna be attributes of your, of your, of your, um, of your class, contains, We'll, we'll go over this a bit more in detail. Obviously the chapter goes over it, but uh, contains is where you would give it that, that uh, lineage. You'd let it inherit, inherit, or I can't even talk, but it would inherit attributes from another class. So this is where you could define additional classes or additional attributes, and this is where you can inherit some. So it just saves you from copying and pasting, um, as well as building up that those layers of complexity, then prototype, where you can define default values for um, the, the data that goes in the slots. And all the examples that I've, that I've seen from Hadley, you're, you're supplying it with NA, um, NA values, but you could also give it default values. And that's, the alternative would just be blank um, values. So it's, it's preferable in that sense. All right, so how do you create a generic for the class? So the class tells us what kind of object it is, gives us some attributes about that object. The generic is that um, function that we're gonna overload with, um, with methods. So it doesn't actually have any um, specific action that it takes except for calling um, that method search or dispatch. So how do we create that? There's a function for that. So we've got the general syntax is set generic, which is in the methods package. You would give it the name you assign your class. So this my class would go in there and then you can define a function. Well, so, so you, you give it a definition, which is, um, I've, I have the exact thing, but it, it's just another function. Uh, and we'll see that a little bit later. I forget what it's called. Uh, how do you create a method? So, right, so the method then is what the, um, the function that will be applied to the type of class it looks up. Um, so how do you define that? Well, there's a, surprise, surprise, there's a function for that. So set method, you take the uh, generic, um, there's a signature argument and there's a definition argument. So the definition, you can put in a, uh, uh, you can write out a function. That'll, that'll be the, the method that's applied. Uh, signature, I forget, I was looking at this earlier, but I forget what signature is. It'll come back to me. If anyone remembers, they can 
jump in. But I don't remember. All right, so next section is going to be about prototypes, constructors, helpers, and validators. So you got the, th the three main um, features of S4, just like S3. It's um, looking at those. It's, it's defining your class, de deciding what kind of data is going gonna, gonna to fall in those, uh, those slots, uh, creating some generics if you need to. Um, that will handle methods for a lot of different classes that you're building in S4. And then setting up those methods. What exactly is the, um, the function, that, the, the process, right? The, so if you're doing the mean, I think one of the examples is you got mean.dataframe. So these methods are specific to object types and there's a different recipe based on the class. All right, so those are the three main ones. Define the, the class with its attributes which would go in the slots for S4, uh, define the generic function that's gonna be a catch-all for a bunch of different methods, um, and then define the specific method for the class, which will get looked up by the, um, by the generic. So within, uh, now with, for dealing with, for making those, that functionality accessible to the end user, we have um, prototypes, constructors, helpers, and validators. So these, um, concepts are more towards helping the, the user use our, our, our tools because we're uh, cool developers in this context, right? We're building stuff. So if the prototype is optional, why should we use it? Oh yeah, because um, I, I remember looking it up and it was, it was um, said, I think it even recommends not to use it, but Hadley's like, no, you should always use it. And my takeaway is um, providing default values just gives you an extra layer of, of security and, and intuition behind. Like it will return something instead of not returning anything. If you don't give it a value, it'll at least return whatever the default value is so that can help with the use case. Um, so I want to build on top of another, right? So I've got this class, I wanna add up some, uh, I wanna wrap that into another class I'm building. I don't wanna copy and paste. Um, so what can I do, right? So that, yeah, that's where you use the contains argument in set class. So that's uh, effectively a shortcut. So you don't have to copy and paste because if you copy and paste, anyway, that's the way I thought of it, right? If you're copying and pasting, there's more uh, potential for errors and it's just a more elegant solution, it's integrated into the entire um, design. So contains is powerful for that. And then if I can use new, which is one of the helper functions to construct an object, why do I even bother creating the constructor? And, and again, yeah, so that was that initial point I made about these are tools for helping the end user, right? So you take these um, this new and you embed new in a function that's going to allow the user to just say, factor this object and it will apply new underneath the hood and 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 you'll specifically tell them what attributes um, they need to provide so what data do they need to give you and then you assign that data to the slots and you can create the um, the object behind the the scene so it just makes it a, a lot more uh, user friendly yeah so we want to help people right and uh these constructors are polite. Yeah, it's really, uh, so it's about thinking of, of the work we, we do as a service for others, which is interesting. I'm a, an analyst, I just do this stuff on my own. Um, so it's helpful to get this perspective of building tools for, for others. All right, so we're gonna continue with this topic. Oh yeah, so we don't, we, we're building these, um, we're, we built a helper to create an object of a class we've, we've designed, but we, we want to make sure that the user doesn't break it, All right? So this is where um, validation comes in and we can apply uh, this function set validity and you tell it the, the class and then you tell it the method. And the method's going to be 
a function that applies different conditions to check if the slot data matches the types you, you expect. So that's the idea there. Like you're going to define this once, you're going to point it at the class that you want to validate the slot data for, the integrity of the slot data. And then you define that in your in your um, in the in the in the function. And that will then check every time that they go to construct a new object of that class, it's going to run this um, validity check behind the scenes and they'll get, and you can put in helpful, helpful error messages and, and everything. So the one loophole is that this um, only applies at um, construction, not on modification. Uh, so what's the option if, if you're looking to uh, prevent them from breaking an object um, when they modify one of the slots? Um, themselves with one of the accessors you've built them, right? So um, you do the, you apply the same logic, like the same idea of wrapping uh, new in a, in a helper, you're gonna wrap the accessors in a, in a function that will have that, those logical checks in it. So you'll do the validation in a function that's giving them access to the slots. All right, so it's, uh, it's a very creative uh, approach to these things. I, I, like, I like it a lot. Um, okay, so any questions so far? It's all pretty straightforward. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about creating and accessing generics and methods. So we've, we've hit on um, creating a class, creating a generic and creating methods. We've talked about ways of um, designing uh, constructors and helpers, uh, helpers as constructors and as accessors that can validate the inputs and make sure that the, the user uh, can, can build objects consistently and reliably. So now we're gonna talk about more specifically this, uh, this process of creating and accessing generics and methods. Okay, so what was the point of a generic again? And again, it's like that, um, that function we're gonna overload, we're gonna, it's gonna be the catch-all. Um, if you got a person object and a, uh, well, no, let's say, I had an analogy here. So if you have Eric, which is me, and you had a cardinal, um, we both wanna fly but the method for flying is gonna be different, right? So um, we still wanna use fly though, because fly is a pretty general, easy to understand um, verb. But for Eric, he's gonna go on a plane. For Cardinal, he's gonna flap his wings and, and fly. So they have different methods. So the point of the generic is to, to let us use a intuitive um, verb for our functions without having the user have to look uh, for different instances of that of that verb based on whatever object they're they're wanting to process. Yeah, so it's it's decomposes functions into generics and methods to solve that general problem. And what was the S four syntax for creating one? We did go over this, but here's a little more uh, specific example. So it's Set generic, the name of uh, the function, what you're gonna call it, and then the definition. Um, and here is, yeah, so I was trying to remember this, is that standard generic. And this is another function that comes with the uh, methods package. Um, so this is how we create our own generics. Set generic, and it's, it's all, love, that's the one good thing about S4 is it's all in the methods package. So you can always just double colon and, and find. It's all, I mean, it's such an error. It's pretty um, intuitive. Um, so we're gonna continue on this subject. So what was the point of the method? So the, the methods, uh, the recipe, how we do something. Um, yeah, so the programmer still has to write functions for every class, but the user 
as a, a standardized interface. And then what's the syntax for creating a method? It's a set method. And then you're pointing at the, uh, the generic, giving it the class, and then giving it the, the function for that class, given that, uh, that generic. It's all pretty straightforward, but you can see how this is um, really refined and structured. Like there's a literally functions for for all these things, and you can build the you can build this these. I mean, it actually, I think in um, the S3 package had the talks about building helper functions and all and 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 best practices in there. So you can replicate a lot of this systematic. Um, fluidity and control into S3, but in S4, it's like they had that in mind as a um, as an improvement. They just built it in. Okay, so we've talked about how generics look up uh, methods based on the class of the object. Well, how does that work? And we've talked about uh, contains as a way that uh, these S4 objects can inherit. Um, or, uh, slots, at, which are attributes from other classes. So how does that come in? I mean, is it looking at multiple classes? And then um, what is multiple dispatch? So we've overloaded our generic functions with a bunch of class specific methods. Now, what do we do, All right? So that's the setup here. Um, it's gonna look for the, it's like a lookup. I kind of think of it like a lookup product, like VLOOKUP from Excel or something like that. Hey, I've got this class of this object that the user passed to me. Now I'm going to go look up a method, and I'm going to apply that method to this to this object. So what if we build classes on top of each other, right? So we've yeah. So that's like evolution. You're evolving into greater complexity. Um, and my, I like to do that little space, and it didn't work there. Um, so what happens there? Well, we get. Uh, oh yeah, so this is this idea of like the shortest path. So uh, the it'll look for the first method it finds. I don't know. I, I didn't really. I don't. I mean, I get it. It's looking. It's going to find the first um, uh, method for the the class that's closest. But I don't have a precise definition of closest. So. Um, I get it, but I don't really get it. But I do know it, it, it will, it doesn't pick two methods. It picks the method that comes first and then there's ambi it you, you can introduce ambiguity if there's um, the same distance, uh, then it will just pick the method that comes first in the alphabet. Uh, so I, I, I get it, but I don't really get it, get it, if that makes sense. So I think closeness is from like contains, right? Like you have, um, like when you define contains, that's one level up or like, you know, one level away. And so you have to go like, if you have to go into the contains from the class that's being contained, that's two levels away, right? And so that's, I think that's how it measures it. So oh. the, gra the graphics are nice, but I think that's kind of how you get there, right? Is it's like, oh, this is contained in that, or this can, sorry, this class, uh, it like inherits from this other class, right? Thus. I mean, there might be other ways to set the links, but that's at least from what we've seen here, how you do it. So if I inherit from my dad, that's closer than inheriting from my granddad or something. So it's gonna stop at dad first. Yeah, it might be like the example they have, which was like people first and then employees. And then what if we made like, um, like clerks or something like, you know, a subset of employees. And so then like if we did made the person and then we made employees which contains person and then we made clerks which contains employees if i try and look up age for clerks it might not if there's no age attribute there it'll go look at employees and if there's no age you know or sorry function there it will that or generic it'll look at person right okay uh, but it might have like maybe there's something like um you know um pay and maybe like clerks have a different pay function from you know overall employees who could have salary or some other thing so maybe there's some other inherited pay method 
that gets used elsewhere. And so you have two different ones, depending on if you're a clerk or if you're say management, you know, so that could be, um, that could be one way to think about it. Or at least that's roughly how I thought about it when I was reading it. Nice. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, thanks. I, I was, I wonder what happens if like, is it ever the case where like you have, you're going up that hierarchy and you have like one version of the method that like is like a default and then like higher up is like the one that's specific to that class that you passed. Like, would it like know that there's like a better option somewhere else? You know what I mean? Like somewhere up, further up, that's like exactly that class for that method, you know? Yeah, so it starts as close, like if you're in that class, let's so say clerk, and you, there was a method for clerk, it would start with that version. But mm -hmm. yeah, you're right, like, um, if you're, say, at uh, employee, it clerk was the best one, but there was also one for person, it wouldn't know, because it can't go back the other way, right? So yeah. I think that's part of that problem, and, and why there's, so, I think he tries to make a point of saying you have to have thought in how you create inheritance, right? Um, yeah. Because like what can, you create first and yeah or yeah. what you define as uh, above or below something yeah i can imagine um like creating the structure for these i'm sure mile conductor like they have to have diagrams to explain like oh this goes to this and you mm -hmm. know all that sort of stuff where um uh, it gets very complicated and it's just the same sort of thing when we were complicated with dispatch in s3 though so i feel like it's the same sort of voodoo yeah, I mean, I feel like it's probably the normal case that, like, if you create, let's say, uh, like, the highest parent class with some kind of method, as you create subclasses, you're defining the method for that subclass in that level that you've created it in, right? Like, yeah. So, like, it should usually, I would imagine it should usually, like, be right there, but maybe that's not always the case. Yeah. Yeah, and I wonder if, if in development you like you make all these sub ones, you know, and you're like, oh, but then you realize that like a more generic version may be appropriate for three or four of them. So you change the hierarchy of things and and structures to allow it. for methods to um, sit at a higher, you know, uh, at a, at a yeah. super class. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So the super class was super class the one you inherit from, or is it? I was getting confused on superclass and subclass. I think subclass is is, uh, is the more specific. So in this case, okay. employee would be the subclass to person. Right. So it's like a tree and more yeah. specific for them. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Terrific. All right. So now um, we can have interaction with us for an S3 because I mean, they're, so, they're conceptually so similar. Um, you can see how it, they just try to refine and, and, and button up some of the functionality um, from S3 to S4. So you, they wanted this to almost be like a uh, progression. So they have a lot of um, mechanisms in place to allow us to, to interact. Um, it seems like it's easier to interact with S3 in the S4 context than it is to go the other way, go downstream. Um, so how does that work? Well, we can actually assign an S3, I think I said object there, but I meant, did I mean object or, or a class? But yeah, we can, yeah, I think I didn't mean object. So you're gonna assign an S3 object to a slot in S4, and you can actually inherit from an S3 object using contains. So you can see how you could bring that S3 um, object and those um, attributes into your into S4 and then build on top of that. And uh, yeah, that sounds super easy and cool. There's probably uh, not a fancy function. I was being facetious because there's functions for everything. And this one does have a function. Um, you have to specify the S3 class as a set old class, which I found funny because there's kind of, there is kind of this, this is the new way and that's the old way. Um, cool kids use S4. 
Uh, so you, you actually say set old class and then you define, um, there's an example here, you define factor as the, uh, as the old class. And now you have built an S4 on top of S3 and you could add additional um, slots and, and, and you could build up on top of that. But um, this would be the, the general syntax for, for incorporating a class into an S4 um, framework. So that's cool. Let's see, what else do we got? All right, I guess that was it for interactions, yeah. So that was it for interactions. I'm surprised, I felt like there was more there, but I must have uh, either run off or maybe that was it. Uh, and, and then one of the points though for interact, yeah, so you can, you can even interact with, um, you can bring in uh, generics and you can bring in, um, well, you bring in generic, I don't know, I'm not gonna say anything else about that because that's it, that's it for interaction, no more interaction. Okay, so what are the trade-offs? So we've, we've gone over uh, S3, which is the wild, wild west, the first object-oriented system. Um, it was there to help us uh, manage an exploding number of functions. So we could call one function that's intuitive and, and let it take care of the complexity of identifying which, which method applies to which class of object. And then we buttoned it down a little bit, gave it a tie, polished it off and, and came out with S4. And then we have R6, which is more of the traditional object-oriented programming. They call it encapsulated. It's apparently the paradigm that you find in, in other programming languages like Python. I think they mentioned Java. So what are the trade-offs? When would we want to use one or the other? Hadley has some suggestions. He says to prioritize S3 um, because it's widely in use. It's uh, more accessible. It's less strict in, in its uses. So you, it's um, just easier to use. You don't have to find all these functions to, to call everything and then remember the arguments and, and all that. So he recommends S3. Um, R6 is super cool. That's what they're building like Shiny's um, built in R6 and what I've learned reading this reading this book is that he uses a bit of, of R6 solutions for some of his packages. He uses some S3, some S4. So um, R6 is, is definitely involved in, in the tidyverse ecosystem. And then S4. So what are the trade-offs when we would use one or the other? So I'm gonna uh, recap some of those trade-offs as best I can here. So for yeah, so they're solving the same solution. And, and one difference between them and R6 is that they have global, like you're, you're, you're not, like with R6, you're, you're kind of narrowed in on, on an R6 environment that is specific. Like you're creating your own little ecosystem within, within R. And then with S3 and S4, you're, you're working with the global uh, toolkit. So they, they, they have different, um, approaches to um, ones like entire R ecosystem one, uh, R6 is more building its own self-contained environment. S4 has the conventions by design, um, but S3 will allow you to um, mimic those conventions if you wanna um, build in that, some of those same functions and helpers and, and everything like that. It's uh, S3 strikes me as more of a self-service friendly tool set. So something like I'd use, like, cause I'm not developing for anybody. I'd, I'd um, just do my own analysis and, and the assets I produce are sent off and consumed by end users, but I'm not um, building tools for, to enable other analysts. So this seems like a, a probably a, a good, a good solution for a lot of my problems. I was thinking of, I have two little boys and um, I don't know Dungeons and Dragons, but I'm interested in it because it's like, uh, it's got probability and there's all, and I was thinking that'd be pretty cool. And I want them to be like creative and, and have a little bit of a, uh, 
a geekiness to them. So I was thinking that'd be something cool to develop at least a small little uh, system for Dungeons and Dragons and, and maybe S4 or I'm getting invaded. What's up guys? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is little Luke. I was just talking about you. How's it going, Luke? Hi. Good. They're going to bed. They just finished uh, bath time. About to have story time. Good night, guys. Are you going to make a cameo, too? This is my oldest. He's itching for it. At least they're dressed. All right. Hello. Skedaddle. What's, what's your name? Ben. Yeah, it's Ben. Ben. This is my oldest, Ben. ben. He's six. And that's my youngest, Luke. He's four. Awesome. Pre-K and kindergarten. Nice, sir. All right, so what about R6 versus S3? So uh, R6 allows you to build up this mini ecosystem of functionality. And Hadley even says that you, can, if you use R6, you can build like idiomatic tools. I think it is because you can build the functionality that's very um, non-standard. It just kind of can almost stand alone, which I think sounds cool for some, a lot of things. Um, I'm, I'm sure the more I learn, I'll think of better use cases besides Dungeons and Dragons, but um, I think it's cool. Oh, and then it has these uh, reference semantics. So uh, you can uh, make a modification and it just modifies the object instead of, and the example they show is like with S3 or S4, you have to, um, you create a copy every, anyway, I don't want to go through the whole example because I'll ruin it, but, um, Reference semantics makes sense to me, uh, theoretically. And it sounds cool. Um, oh, and you can string together uh, method calls with this dollar sign. So it's kind of similar to the pipe. That seems cool. Um, oh, and another feature I thought was interesting, right, um, is you a lot of the, um, the details are behind the scenes with R6. So you can, and, and they're, they're accessing um, functions like that. They're accessing your system through uh, functions that you don't need to actually change the name of the functions. You can change things underneath the hood and they'll, and it won't break any of their use cases. So I thought that was a nice feature. Um, so that is, that is it for chapters 15 and 16. I think high level S3 is a little more, a little less formal. S4 is a little more formal. Um, R6 is um, self-contained and, and more similar to object-oriented program paradigms you'd find in other languages. Um, if you're doing wild, wild west data analysis um, and even programming tools for other analysts to use, you could. Uh, start with S3 if you have if you're going to work with a broader community and you want to have some of those conventions baked into the um, to how you use the um, to use the object oriented programming paradigm then you'd probably want S4 because those conventions are baked in you don't have to just adopt have these recommendations um, they're baked into S4 so that'd be good for a collaborative effort and then R6 when you need self-contained tools that are um, gonna give you some cool um, functionality. It sounds like R6 would be great for that. Cool. Thank, thanks, Eric. You're um, can I just make, I just want a general comment. Yeah, this is an awesome job um, about uh, the, um, about these three chapters, like I feel like before these, when thinking about classes, I just thought there were some scary, like amorphous, like like uh, hard to understand thing. And then when I read the S three chapter, I was like, wait, it's just a a list with certain elements that then that where you and then uh, like a then that object just gets handled in a different way for different methods, you know? Like I just like it seems so. Uh, so much like 
I don't know, especially S3 just seems so minimal. Like, uh, it's just surprising to me that like, that's a, that's like a class, you know, like it, like whenever I have read, read like Python code or whatever, where they're making classes, like it's all this like stuff where I'm looking, you know, it's like, like, um, you know, there's like an init method and like all this stuff to it. It's like really heavy looking and like kind of like not easy to like follow sometimes. Um, I don't know. It just, yeah, it, it's just, that was, just, it's just like, that's, I don't know, the main impression I have after, even with all these, like all the chapters really, except for, I guess, I guess S3 and S4, I feel that way. Um, it just seems very like, I know S, S4 is like more formal, but it just like, it takes so little code to like do it, you know, to like create something. I don't know. Yeah. I agree with you. Like it used, like it seems more approachable now, at least like less scary to experiment with it. And yeah, you can see it gets complex and, and wild looking. But it feels much yeah. more approachable now. Yeah. And to be honest, like R6 just seems kind of like, I don't know. I feel like the code is like kind of ugly, but <laughs> like just like the dollar sign. I don't know. Is it, like, I don't, uh, it, I feel like S3 and S4 are like much easier to like read and follow. And um, it's just my opinion, I guess, but. Um, Is Jake here? He had to leave. Oh, he did. He I dropped like a few minutes ago. He's yeah. heavy developing. Yeah, I wonder like, like at what point, like I feel like there's a continuum of like development, like where you, you're like writing code for particular purpose and you have like a script and then you're doing a bunch of things over and over again and you create functions so you don't have to like repeat that code. And then like, I feel like at some point it then becomes like, you can, you're like, you can start to consider like a class at some point, but like what, at what point do you like start to think about that? You know, or, you know what I mean? Like, 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 like what's the triggering like moment? Is it that, oh, you want like a bunch of people to be able to use, uh, like, I don't know, or I don't know how to even describe it, but um, like you want a bunch of people to be able to work with a certain type of data uh, that gets handled in a consistent way, but you want to abstract kind of some of the, the guts of it away so they can just like, call a simple method on a certain type of object, certain type of data, and it'll get handled in that way every time, like people to expect, I don't know, like, like where, like, when do you say, okay, now I should create classes? <laughs> yeah, like, does it allow you to do anything that you couldn't do without object-oriented programming? I don't know. Because if I think like LM or these, these um, these objects, they, they take a lot of computation and they store the, the details, right? Within, right. The, within the LM object or, or whatever it may be. So it's like, it, so it's, it's effectively this, this complex process to get out the, um, the analysis stored in this object that you can access in a, a, a user-friendly way. So maybe it is like a level of complexity that's the trigger. Yeah, it might be the functions applied on them too, right? Like with LM, it's different from, if you plot LM, it's different from plotting a different type of class, right? And so I guess if you know you're gonna be cooking up slightly different uses of the same um, functions, then maybe you do wanna start using classes or, you know, and, and maybe it partially is related to how you're storing that data. Because in, in the case of LM, it's not just storing a model, it's storing the model and, and a bunch of other relative, related information. So maybe that's the point, right? It's it's when you have a lot of touch points or you are giving it to a, a lot of other people are using it and you need to have that data be accessible in some kind of organized fashion. And if there's distinct methodology, then yeah, then now it's associated in the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Like. Like if you have like a coherent unit of something that's like 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 
that isn't well defined by any existing like object that you have or something uh, that's like a mixture of different types of information but that like kind of whole, should be held together then that's a case or a class yeah yeah i was trying to think if i have you know like if I'll end up where I can apply this, because that was you know one of your questions, Kevin, was where maybe these are applicable. And I was thinking like if I have production versions of a model and I have associated data for that and like other associated information that I want to store related to it, maybe that's something where I have a class for that. Um, you know, and then maybe I have like a superset of my performance tools just called like perf tool, which runs on that and can give me everything back that's associated with you know, this model. And so maybe that's one way to use it. Um, the idea of people is really, easy, you know, that's applicable, right? Because if you have, in our case, we have players. So like if I wanted to store players uh, and talk about, okay, well, I have this information from one data set and this other information, and maybe I have some way I'm up linking all this together, that would be useful. Right, and then you can make a method like best season or best game yeah. or like something like that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I have like um, like max could idea. be best or something or I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, like I was thinking like uh, you know like um, maybe like habits or traits or you know like um, areas for improvement, and then maybe I have some code that depending on the player and actually maybe depending on where they are in their career. Right, if they're a prospect, maybe it's very different from a guy who's near, uh, who's a longtime pro, mm -hmm. and you know maybe those are subclasses. But then it's like, okay, well, tell me what are things about them they're good or bad at, and so I can just spit this out automatically, given all the data I know contextually around the player. That's actually a very useful thing that I might actually do. But uh, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> but like that's a uh, that's the sort of thing that you know I was thinking is like an application. Um, Mm -hmm. But like I, I'm not sure that I would ever go to R6 for something like that. I might just use R3 because it's um, or sorry S3 because it's mm -hmm. has the least amount of restrictions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fun to talk through, through these examples. Um, yeah, the one the one that I was thinking about, I was trying to think about stuff for work and I work with uh, like log files a lot. Um, with like a pretty consistent like format. But um, I was thinking of a way to do that where like, I don't know, maybe I want to store some like meta information about each log file in, in addition to the file, like the text, text itself. So maybe I want to like store like the date that it was like pulled or something, or I don't know, like other stuff. And then if I want to like print it, I print only the first few lines. I don't know, I'm just trying to think of ways to apply it in work in my work but um like if you just had like a log file object and then i don't know like if i really wanted to easily concatenate them maybe i can make like a, a addition method or something where i just like like just do this log object plus this yeah. log object you know i don't know yeah so you could find you could define your own method to act on the class for logs and then mm -hmm. you might have some idea of like um if you were trying to look at the delta of logs, you know, like some idea of what's the mm. difference between them. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of your example too with that kind of set stuff. Uh, like if you did like a union or something, you could be like, these are all the games that these players started in together or something like yeah. that. Or I don't know. Something yeah. Something. Luckily I, I have a data engineer, so I don't have to do that hard work. I can just pass it to them. We get these, um, I was thinking of a use case for uh, for me, it's uh, we get these surveys. And so with surveys that we'll do like, you can, it's typically one question, thankfully, um, but we have multi-select, we have free form text, we have single select, and sometimes they're passing back a, like an index number that I, that you have to look for a lookup table to get an actual value that they pass through, but it's always JSON, so like, It'd be great to have a, a class of multi-select, a class of single select, a class of free form, and then have it, and then just say, create whatever. Because I do a, I create a visual, and then I, or I'll put out just the raw um, text responses, or I'll do a sentiment analysis, or and then just 
have function that, that processes it based on the class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. So I so going off of your example, like if you created a class for each of those types of questions, like and you put it in a data frame, let's say, like as long as you defined a class, will that be can you make it like a data frame column that you're like user defined class? You know what I mean? Um like I haven't it's interesting because like a lot of these examples are just kind of like on their own. Like I haven't seen it integrated with like, you know, like a mixed type like data frame or something, you know. Well, really, I guess I would be I would want it would be a data frame, but I'd want the um the process. I, yeah, so I just wanted to call a different function, different uh, function for the um, multi select because the multi select I actually have to um, spread to rows because it's mm -hmm. all row and I have to spread it to the rows and then I uh, I still did the group by mm -hmm. and, and I still create a very similar graph, but because it and and I have to clean up like there's some um, clean up that. I have to do for the multi-select output that I don't have to do for mm. select um, because I have a um, a a view up in SQL that um, takes in all these surveys and it has like a default processing, but it totally misses out on processing the multi-selects correctly. Um, so then I have to do that um, separately because mm -hmm. I don't know how to do. That you can use like JSON table. There's a SQL function called mm -hmm. table, and it will unpack JSON stuff. But it, it, I haven't been able to get it to to work with everything in in SQL itself. So I'd have to mm -hmm. useful to just be able to tell um, the, to be able to give it a class multi-select and have the function just look up the uh, have the generic look up the right processing. Right, structure. like a like a decode or an encode or something like that. Yeah. If you're given, I'm just gonna write that down. I like <laughs> Someone was talking about that on Twitter today, and like our our Twitter or something. Like they were like, it was like translating some kind of code, and they were asking like, should I call it like decode or translate or something? But that's a, that's where I, where I thought of it from. But um, but yeah, but with your example though, like if you did have it in a data frame and you like didn't unnest, but it was like your class. And maybe if you like summarized and like you did like sum or something, like it would know what to do with that class. You know, if it was like, like it would like, uh, I don't know, maybe like, I did, this is just totally making it up, but maybe you wanted to like average all of the choices or something like that in the multi-select and then add it, or I, I don't know, like, like you could define like a summarized method or something, something for that class. Um, or maybe it automatically like because they're the class construct constructor needs like a lookup table or something. It automatically like can find the free most frequent answer without actually doing that translation. I don't know. It's fun to think about though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got to run to the other uh, yeah. the other one. So next week, uh, Kevin, I'm supposed to present. I believe so. Yeah. So next okay. week is the. Uh, uh, yeah, it's the first section of the big picture section. Yeah. Um, Meta. Yeah, I can do yeah the intro and then um, seventeen the yeah. big picture. Or are you thinking of doing expressions also? Uh, how long is big picture? Uh, it's not super long. Yeah, let me let me. Um, I'll touch base with you after I give it a read through to see if I I have the. Uh, stamina to do uh, 18 as well, but uh, okay. at least I'll do intro and big picture. Sounds good. All right. All right. Please remember how, what, how much work it is putting these together <laughs> when I'm in the midst yeah. of putting it together. <laughs> yeah, like like reading something versus right. explaining it is definitely different. Yeah, guys, I had to watch like videos. All right, see ya. All right, guys. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Awesome. No worries, man. Job. See you guys. Yeah. See ya. Bye.